The suspension unit is found on most mountain bikes, like a suspension fork, or perhaps in some cases a rear shock, are absolutely key to the way that the bike handles off-road. Yet, the way that they're set up isn't always dealt with correctly, and worse, some people don't maintain them correctly. So today we're going to look into everything you need to know about suspension forks and shocks and how to look after them, so you can get the most out of them. In this video, we're going to be using Suntour products. We've got a Suntour rear shock and we've got a Suntour suspension fork. They actually asked us to make this video to shed a bit of light on what suspension units actually do, how you set them up, how you maintain them, all that sort of stuff. Because really the key with mountain bike suspension is to understand exactly what's going on. Now, don't worry if your bike doesn't have Suntour on there as a brand, because the principles I'm going to be talking about here apply to virtually every suspension fork and shock on the market. Okay, so let's start by having a bit of a breakdown of the suspension forks so you can understand what all the parts are called and what they do. Starting with the steerer tube at the top. So this obviously goes into the frame of the bike and the stem clamps on there. The actual steerer tube is press fitted by design into the actual crown as are the upper legs. Now these upper legs uh, in the business are known as the stanchion tubes here. Now something important to say, because these are uh, press fit design, if you're to damage any part here, do something wrong, for example, like trim the steerer tube too short uh, or damage your stanchion tubes in a crash, it's more than likely you can have to replace this whole unit, which is known as a CSU, which stands for Crown Steerer Upper. Uh, now that, in some cases, can be about half the price of a fork, so you need to look after your suspension forks because it'll be quite costly if you get it wrong. Now, the lower legs are also known as the sliders because they slide over the stanchion design there. Now, the lower legs comprise of a uh, left and a right leg joined by an arch here. Now this arch is in place to basically give the fork steering rigidity, because if it wasn't there, everything would get a bit floppy. And at the bottom you have an axle system. Now the width between the fork legs tends to be 110 millimeters, which is known as boost, but older designs can be 100 millimeters. Fork axles tend to be 15 millimeters universally on bikes. Uh, downhill bikes can have 20 millimeters, as can some dirt jump forks or older designs. But like I said, the 15 is pretty common. And you'll have two major styles of design in which you can actually put the axle into the fork. Some are simply using an Allen bolt, um, basically an axle that just winds straight in using an Allen key, so it could be a six millimeter on there. Or like this one, you have a cam system, in which case the axle can just slide straight out of the fork. Now, if I flip around to the back, you'll see the disc brake mount here. Now, depending on the usage of the fork, i.e. a cross-country fork or a downhill fork, you're going to use very different disc rotor sizes. A cross-country fork, you could be running 160 or maybe a 180 mil rotor. On a downhill bike, you'll be 200 mil or maybe 220. So it's kind of representative of the size of this because you ideally don't want to be using loads of spaces to get a big rotor. You want to basically mount as direct as possible. A uh, pretty universal system, you see this post mount system across the board. One little addition here that's very cool on the Suntour fork that you don't see on many others um, is these little nipples here. So you remove these little Allen bolts and you can put a syringe directly here and you can aid lubrication straight into the fork without having to take the fork apart. Uh, that's actually a really cool feature and we'll get into how you use that a bit later. Now, on all suspension forks you have a sprung leg and you have a damper leg. Now on the left leg here you have a positive air chamber and a negative air chamber with the piston separating them. Now they're both inflated from the same Schrader valve at the top of the leg there and the air is equalized into that negative chamber by a little transfer port. Now why would you want a negative air spring in a fork? So the effect of a negative air spring is essentially to counter what the, the positive does. If you were to only have a positive air spring you have to overcome the initial force to get it moving which means uh, it's not going to move very well to small bumps so it's not going to be a very sensitive fork. If you have a nice big negative air spring in there, it's going to feel really sensitive to small bumps, really grippy, really comfortable, really nice. And the rider's right leg, in this case when you look down, has the damper unit in it. So it won't always be on this side, it might be on the rider's left, depending on the model of fork you have. Now generally speaking, you will have a compression dial or switch, which will be blue, and you'll have a rebound dial, which will be red. Now rebound on most forks tends to be at the bottom of the leg, and compression tends to be at the top. Okay, so let's have a look at a typical rear shock and you get your eyes on this and understand it a bit. So you have your shaft, you have the body. In this case, you have a piggyback, which I'll explain in a minute. You have the eyelets at either end where it's mounted to the frame. Now you might notice that you have a conventional looking eyelet here. On this one, it has what's known as a trunnion mount, which means you actually, uh, you basically bolt directly into the shock body. 
The reason for this, instead of having an additional eyelet on the end, is essentially they can make the body bigger. More stuff on the inside means better handling, better response, essentially. So uh, it's just a way of getting more into the shock without affecting the performance. And then the damping controls on here, as with all damping, red for rebound, blue for compression. Now, some shocks will have four-way damping on, some will have two, like this one here. Uh, the rebound is a low speed operation, uh, which we'll get into shortly. And you have a switch here for the compression. This is a three way system, which essentially means open, mid and locked. Uh, but the locked position doesn't mean it's uh, not going to move whatsoever. It means it will resist almost all your rider movement. But when you hit an impact, it will blow off and open up, uh, protecting the internals of that shock. Now, let's talk about the piggyback here. So let's understand what's going on on the inside of a shock. On the inside, you essentially have a smaller version of this outside. So you have a shaft on the inside here, and on that shaft, you have a piston head, which has a series of shims and ports of which the oil is forced through. Now, when you compress the shock, that oil is obviously displaced. It has to go somewhere. So traditionally, on the inside of shocks, you would just have air in there, and you'd compress that air. But as the air and oil would mix together, uh, it basically cavitates and you would get some of that air would make its way back through those ports and shims in the system. You'd get really erratic handling with the damping. So what shock designers started doing was implementing an IFP. So that's an internal floating piston. So you have oil on one side and air on the other side. And what it means is as you compress the shock, that oil essentially compresses the IFP against the air there. So a really neat system. Now, in a shock body that doesn't have a piggyback there, if you were to ride it, say, on an extremely long, fast and rough descent, perhaps a 40 minute alpine descent, two things can happen on the inside. One of them is that the oil is naturally going to get hotter. As oil gets hotter, uh, viscosity changes slightly, it gets thinner. So you're going to get slightly erratic handling in terms of your compression damping and your rebound damping. But also the air is going to expand as it heats up on the inside there. As it expands, the shock is naturally going to get faster in terms of rebound, which of course combined with the viscosity change of the oil there, uh, you get slightly more erratic handling, which is why you get some units that have a piggyback design. Now you'll only find these typically on longer, bigger travel bikes, shocks with a lot more travel. You won't find this on a cross country bike, for example. Uh, the results of having a piggyback design on there, essentially you've got much more oil in there. So more oil means it's going to handle much more consistently and you move the IFP from the main body, you move it to the outside, so it's not affected by the heat from the shock compressing. So you've got a much more consistent performance. The only downside is it's slightly heavier, so you're not gonna see it on all bikes because it's simply not needed on all bikes. Now there's three major adjustments. There's rebound damping, there's compression damping, and there's your air pressure. So the air pressure, you set up a thing known as sag. So that is how much the fork essentially will sag into its travel uh, when you get on the bike. Now, why would you want sag? Well, simply is to make the fork respond to the terrain as it should do, is to allow the wheel to track into hollows into the ground as well as coming up to the rider. Now, if you have not enough sag, the effect of this is, yes, your fork will feel fine and you're going to be able to use it, but you might never get full travel. Essentially, it's going to feel too firm for you and it might feel quite harsh on the smaller bumps. The opposite can be said if you have too much sag. Uh, you'll sit further into the travel than the manufacturer of the fork intended you to, which means it might feel a bit lethargic, not quite as active as it should be. And also, you're going to use too much travel too often. So there's a happy medium to be had. And on most major forks, it's going to be between 20 and 30% of the available travel as sag. Now, most manufacturers have handy charts, sometimes printed on a fork, sometimes with the manual they come with, giving you a quick start guide. So for example, if you are 95 kilos, it might tell you to put in 105 PSI as your good base setting. So super handy stuff. And to be honest, across the board, those base settings are almost always accurate as well. Now, when it comes to actually inflating the air, firstly, make sure you use a really good quality shock pump. Secondly, make sure you get it onto the actual valve correctly. It's got to go on fully and straight. Don't risk damaging the threads. Don't rush it. Take your time. And the final thing to say is when you're inflating the fork, you need to balance out the air chambers on the inside. So to do this, you essentially would get the sag roughly where you see fit. Then you'd remove the shock pump and then cycle the fork through the travel, about halfway through the travel, a number of times. 
uh, and the force should equalize. And if you need to add any more pressure or take it away, you then put the shock pump back in place. Next up, let's talk about compression damping. Now, compression tends to happen in two major styles. You get low speed compression and you get high speed compression. Now, if your fork has an adjustment on there, almost certainly it will have low speed compression, but not all forks have externally adjustable high speed compression. This particular one, you can adjust both low speed and high speed. And on this one, they are dials. Your bike might have a lever on there, might be a two or three position. If that's the case, it's a low speed compression lever. Now, what's the difference between low speed and high speed? Uh, it's not about the speed you're riding at, it's about the velocity of the fork, how fast the fork is moving under an impact. So high speed, as you'd imagine, is when the fork's moving really fast. And when does it move fast? When you hit a big bump. If you land off a jump, if you ride into a curb-sized rock, something like that, that is a high speed impact. And that is the adjustment that you need to absorb or at least control the fork as it slows down. If it's not controlled, it will just smash through the travel. If you have too much high speed compression on there, it will feel very harsh. If you don't have enough, you'll be bottoming out uh, too easily, essentially. Now, when it comes to low speed compression, this is about isolating the fork from unwanted movement. Uh, one good example might be if you're out the saddle pedaling, if you don't have any low speed compression, the fork can be bobbing around. If you have loads of low speed compression on there, it resists moving to that. But when you hit a bump, it will still move. Lots of low speed compression on there can actually make the fork uh, not perform very well to smaller hits. Uh, it won't feel very sensitive, but it can feel really efficient. So that's why any fork that has adjustment tends to have a low speed adjustment because you can rapidly alter the way that the fork feels. Now, when it comes to making adjustments to compression, if your unit has a dial like this one uh, that's indexed with clearly defined clicks between them, the manufacturer will refer to the uh, adjustments you make in clicks. But it's important to notice that across the board, it's pretty typical that the clicks will be from a closed unit. So closed means when you've got all of the damping on. So you turn the dial all the way to the right, you know, like clockwise, uh, and then you undo it by the amount of clicks that you're recommended in the setup guide. Your next adjustment is the rebound damping. Now this can have a dramatic effect on the way that the fork performs. Now rebound, as you'd imagine, is the fork as it extends. Now the first thing to really note with this is the heavier rider you are, the more rebound that you will need because you will have a heavier spring rate in there. That heavier spring rate will need more control. So think of rebound as control. Now ideally, you want the fork to feel as fast as possible, so as little rebound damping as possible without erratic handling. Now no one rider will have it the same as others. Now, typically you will have a single red rebound dial on the bottom of a fork, and it really corresponds to the low speed rebound. This particular fork has two settings. You can adjust the high speed and the low speed. So quite a complex item to set up and really fine tune, but you can get really good performance out of a fork that offers both of these settings. And the last thing that you need to know about suspension forks are on some options out there, you can adjust the air volume of the actual air spring. So by installing a number of these on the inside of the air chamber on the relevant fork, you're actually reducing the size of the air volume in there. And then according to that, you're changing the characteristics of the fork. Now, why would you want to change the air volume on the inside of the fork? You can have a fork feeling more linear or more progressive. If you're using your travel and bottoming out too often, you're gonna want it more progressive to resist that. Uh, so you can add and subtract them to get the ride qualities that you're looking for. Okay, so let's talk about the rear shocks on bikes and the, and the sorts of adjustments you have, because you're a little bit more simplified in terms of what you can actually do to them. Now, this one has an air valve on here and it has adjustable rebound and compression, but it only has two forms of rebound and compression, which is fairly common across the board. The high speed compression and the high speed rebound will be taken care of internally with the shim stack there. Now, this is known as the shock tune and it's something specified by the frame designer so chances are the shock that you have on your bike will be designed for it so you won't need to make that adjustment you only need to take care of these ones so dramatically simplified compared to setting up a fork with more adjustment now the first adjustment you want to make on your rear shock will be your air pressure the same thing applies to the suspension fork you're looking to set up the sag now when attaching a shock pump take note of the max pressure in your shock this one actually says on the actual cap air pressure max 300 psi. Just bear in mind that as a shock compresses, it's gonna be a much greater equivalent uh, pressure on the inside. So 
don't be tempted to go any higher than that. As with the front suspension, you want to look at a setting somewhere typically between 20 and 30% of available travel as sag. Less sag means your rear wheel uh, won't stick to the ground quite as well. The bike will sit higher up in the travel and might feel a bit harsher and you might not use all of that travel. Too much sag means the bike's going to sit further into the travel. As a result, we'll feel a little bit less responsive. You'll use too much travel all the time. And almost certainly, you'll be in danger of hitting your feet on the rocks on the ground. Okay, so let's look at the compression adjustment. This case has a lever. This is a fairly typical design you'll see on many brands on the market. Some will have two position and some like this one will have three positions. You have an open, a mid and a closed. So open, you would want to be using for those nice fun descents where you want the shock to be working as much as possible. The mid setting is really useful for when you want the shock to be working loads, but it gives you a bit more of a pedaling platform, a bit more resistance to moving around to your body weight. Don't forget this is a low speed compression adjustment. So it works in the same way as it does on the suspension fork. And then when you fully close it, uh, essentially it resists moving almost completely. However, it has a blow off feature, so uh, it will still allow oil to pass past those shims and through the ports in order to uh, use the shock. It's basically so it doesn't damage the internals there. So it will never be completely locked out. And then of course the red adjustment, which is your rebound, which is almost always a low speed setting. If you have too little in terms of rebound damping, the bike can feel quite springy. If you have too much, it can feel quite lethargic. It can stick down and there can be a phenomenon known as packing down where the shock might not recover fully or extend between impacts. So again, like the front end, you want to have as little rebound damping as possible uh, without erratic handling. And the last form of adjustment on air shocks is air volume adjustment. Just like on the forks, you have a system of bands or spacers that can be installed. Now there's different systems. Some of them, you would actually remove the whole air body here itself and you have access to the piston on the inside and you would clip on spacers on there. And it has the same effect by changing the size or uh, the volume of the air chamber there and you'd replace it. Other designs like this one, which works actually very similar to the Fox system as well, you remove this outer sleeve. So you remove the air pressure from the actual shock itself, you remove this O-ring at the bottom here and you slide this outer sleeve off and you have access where you can install a number of bands here. Uh, the more bands you fit in place here, uh, the more progressive it's gonna feel. Now don't forget that too many of these and it could end up feeling too harsh, too little. It might feel too linear for your riding preference, uh, but it's a fun thing to experiment with nonetheless. So one of the cool things with these forks is that you can actually get oil directly in under the seals by removing this small Allen bolt right here. And you can basically put a syringe directly in place there and put your fork liquid. So it's five cc's of 15 weight oil. Now, the amount of oil you put into your fork, into the lowers is quite crucial because you can damage the cartridge on some designs. Some will say don't go further than five cc's in each leg. Um, now there is a bit of resistance when you go and push this in. The best way to do this really would be with the fork upright uh, on your bike and actually cycle the fork through the travel as you just kind of push some of the fluid in. Now you'd probably expect as well when you remove the syringe for some oil to purge away from here. So you've got to make sure you clean this up, especially because this leg is actually the braking leg. So you wouldn't want any of this oil to go near your actual brake. Now adding oil directly into these quick service ports is a really cool idea, but more than likely you won't have these on your forks. So this is something exclusive currently on the Suntour fork. So there's two other methods that you can get oil into the fork lowers without having to do a sort of rebuild on the bike. Now one of them is by putting the oil directly under the fork seals. Now you want to carefully just remove the garter spring. You may need something just to prise it off. Obviously be careful you don't scratch your fork stanchions there in doing so. There we go, so just move that up and out of the way. You might need a cable tie that's got a really stiff end, but the idea is you carefully push it under the seal and then you have the ability to get oil to go directly under the seal. Now you would put a bit of oil under, then compress the fork slightly and then move around as you compress the fork, that oil would basically bring out anything dirty that's underneath the seal and also additionally lubricate it. So it's kind of a cheat way of 
the same effect that Suntour has with their QSP ports. If you don't actually have some suitable fork oil to get into the underneath of the seals there, one other thing that you may have in your collection is some kind of bike spray or polish, uh, which will be silicon based. So this particular one from Muckoff is actually safe to use around fork seals. And actually one of the uses they suggest for it is to spray on these stanchion tubes. Now, if you're gonna do this, make sure the mist of it can't go anywhere near the brakes um, on the front end of the bike because it's a polish. It will uh, basically write off your front brake and you'll end up having to get new disc pads and potentially a new disc rotor as well. However, this stuff can be really quite effective. The idea is to spray it on the stanchion tube and then you basically compress the fork a number of times and what you'll find is it pulls out all the muck and the ingress uh, just on the inside of the seals there and hopefully gives it a bit more of a slippery response as well. So depending on the conditions you ride in, exceptionally dry or exceptionally wet, that's actually a pretty useful thing to do, I'd say probably every sort of 25 hours, maybe even less than that to be fair, if you're riding in filthy conditions. Uh, it will certainly do no harm uh, by making sure the seals are as clean as possible. Now there's one other method as well if you want to get some lube into the lower legs of your fork. Now when you undo the foot nuts or the foot bolts on a fork, you'll find there will be some excess lube that's in there. It's probably quite grimy as well, so make sure you have an oil pan, an old takeaway carton, anything you can to catch that oil. Now, you obviously want to get that oil recycled, but you don't need to do a full lower leg service at this point. You can literally just pull those lower legs just slightly away from those foot bolts and it gives you the access to put some fresh lube back in again. Again, you've got to make sure, depending on the model of fork you have, uh, the volume of oil that, that you put in each leg will be different and the type of oil as well. Something that doesn't take much time and guaranteed it will make your fork feel that bit slicker. So this is very similar to an air can service where you'd slide this off, you'd basically clean the seal out uh, and then put a tiny bit of oil and grease around the seal and slide it back in place. To do this, you do need to remove the shock hardware. So uh, depending on what yours is, uh, you might have additional spaces on there. There will be some very fine o-ring washers in place. Just make sure when you slide it all out, you don't damage any of the individual parts. Remove the o-ring on that shock body and then very carefully pass the main body over and then you're exposed to what's well, essentially the damper that's on the inside. So this unit is what you need to have serviced annually. Now this isn't really something you want to do yourself. But as far as this is concerned, this is highly pressurized on the inside as well. So definitely get that sent off to your local servicing center, bike shop, uh, suspension center, something like that. But uh, pretty simple process. As far as doing your air can service goes, at this point you just want to clean and inspect everything. Make sure the quad seal here is clean and it has no damage on it. Uh, this one, as you can see, is a, almost a brand new shock. So you just make sure you've got a fresh bit of suspension grease on here and make sure that the seal on the inside here doesn't have any obvious damage and it's not dirty. Give it a clean, fresh bit of grease on the inside, a tiny bit of float fluid on there, and then you would slide it back in place. And then that would be an air sleeve service undertaken. Of course, you want to make sure you check all of the bolts, you want to check that your adjusters work correctly, and that's really it. Looking after your suspension is pretty easy when you understand exactly what is going on. Hopefully this video has been helpful for you to understand a bit about what's going on with your suspension forks and your shock, how to adjust them, how to set them up, adjusting your sag, and a bit of routine maintenance, and more importantly, those expensive service intervals that you do need to pay attention to. Uh, if you've got any more questions about suspension forks and shocks and this sort of stuff, let us know in the comments underneath, and we'll see you in the next video. See you later.